Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're very lucky today to have uh, two talks uh, from former Geminites, um, Ms. Lane Dorjaville and uh, Francois Rigaud. And um, they are coming to us from a uh, Australian National University in Canberra. Mm -hmm. um, before that, they were in Gemini South, and before that, they were here. So um, they're going to tell us about their um, recent work on adaptive objects for us. Yes, thank you. It was good to see so many familiar faces. I think that's uh, kind of a majority here. Sorry for those I don't know yet, but I'll be happy to uh, meet you afterwards. So as you know, uh, we were here at Gemini North until 2006, when we moved to Chile, uh, worked there on the multi-conjugate adaptive optics system with Francois until 2011. And in 2012, we moved to the, the Austrian National University in Canberra. So we're still doing adaptive optics and laser guy stars. And we've met, you know, at many conferences since then. So it's not big news, I think, for most of you. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, my uh, pet project, the semiconductor guy star laser. Yes, it's another type of laser. And I know you're busy commissioning uh, the, first, the, the previous generation, but I want to tell you what's coming next and, uh, you know, if you think of uh, upgrading someday. <laughs> so this is called the semiconductor guide star laser because it's based on semiconductor guide star, I'm sorry, semiconductor laser technology. And this is a fairly large team. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program itself and who's in it, um, our development status and uh, what we're going to do next to test the system on Sky. This is uh, the same presentation I gave at SPIE, so my apologies to those who've uh, mm -hmm. already seen it, but I will provide some updates because there's been progress <laughs> since then. So the rationale for doing this work is always the same. We want smaller, uh, better, and um, um, more efficient lasers uh, to do laser guest stars for astronomy, but not just for astronomy. Uh, one of the main drivers is really to do adaptive optics for other applications, uh, which require a laser guide star on sky. So that's uh, a space situational awareness. Francois and I have been involved with um, uh, a program at uh, the Austrian National University working with industry partners to do uh, satellite imaging, satellite tracking, and debris tracking. And uh, optimally, um, lately, uh, we're going to try to do debris pushing, so using another bigger laser to, uh, to move those debris on the sky. But I'll come back to that. Um, and the other application also is going to be laser communication. So we're talking about putting this laser in the future on smaller telescopes than the Gemini telescope. It would work on Gemini just fine, but uh, the idea is to be able to have a system that we can put on a one to two meter uh, diameter, a meter diameter uh, type telescopes. So you're familiar with our previous systems, uh, maybe not so much with the, the dye lasers that were used uh, in the 1990s. Uh, this is a picture of the, the alpha laser uh, in uh, Cataracto in Spain, which was one of the first uh, lasers used on sky for 
use a guest cell demonstration and, and actually uh, science use. You, of course, know about the second generation type of lasers because we developed them here with Gemini and, uh, and collaborators uh, around the United States. Um, this is a picture of the Gemini soft laser, which has now been decommissioned and replaced by Toptica laser. And this is the Toptica laser, which you all know about because you're commissioning it <laughs> right now at Gemini North. So first generation, second generation, third generation, fiber lasers are, are the, um, the way to go uh, these days. They're definitely a very uh, powerful technology and very reliable. But, you know, there's just one vendor for that technology and they're still kind of expensive. So <laughs> I'm thinking maybe we can do uh, better um, by exploring this uh, new technology, which is based on semiconductor lasers. So we're talking about using a semiconductor chip. So we're talking really small. The chip is about <coughs> a few millimeters across, about 10 micron um, high. Um, it's made of um, distributed uh, brilliant, uh, I'm sorry, distributed bright gratings here that will make the, the reflective mirror and some corner wells, which are the laser gain. So it's a really small laser gain area, but it's, it's very powerful. You can get uh, several uh, tens of watts and up to a few uh, hundred watts in, in certain uh, systems. Uh, not that the wavelength we're interested in, not yet, but uh, uh, there are commercial systems that are being um, uh, sold by a coherent um, at other wavelengths, 532 in particular, uh, 532 nanometer in the green. So we want to do exactly the same thing, but at 589. So the trick is really to modify the, the recipe of the semiconductor uh, material so that the system lays is not at 589 directly, uh, but at uh, double that, 1178. So the, the laser cavity is really small. There's just three mirrors. Uh, this is the, the semiconductor chip here. This is just a turn mirror, and that's the... Um, um, the end of the of the cavity. This mirror is mounted on a on a piezoelectric um, actuator, so that we can change the cavity length. There's a couple more uh, additional elements in the cavity to uh, down select the just one mode of the laser cavity and operate single frequency. Oh, I didn't mention we're going to do the same laser format, exactly same laser format as the optical laser. So we're talking continuous wave laser, single frequency operation, locked to the sodium D2 line. Uh, to the to a line. Um, and so to narrow down the, the bandwidth, the laser bandwidth of the laser emitter uh, down to just one mode of the cavity, we have a um, birefringent filter and an etalon. And in this, this arm of the cavity, we'll we're doubling the wavelength, which is 1178 uh, emitted by the uh, chip to 589 with a um, LBO crystal. So those of you who've heard about Vexel systems or OPSL systems, that's the same thing. We're really talking about semiconductor technology here. So this program um, started uh, about a year ago. I applied for funding at the, uh, with the Australian Research Council and uh, got um, a number of uh, people who were keen to work on this project. So uh, our partners in academia in Australia are the University of New South Wales, um, observatories around the world, the AO in Australia, and the Giant Magellan Telescope in the US. Our industry partners are US Space Systems in Australia and uh, Lockheed Martin. And um, the vendor we're working with uh, to um, develop the technology and, and uh, uh, in the end commercialize it, that's the goal, is uh, RIT Associates, which uh, they're based in, um, in Colorado, in Longmont, and not very far from Boulder. So this is uh, for now a $1.3 million Australian dollar project. Um, we received funding in the body call measures from uh, the ARC, the Australian Research Council, through this type of grant, linkage infrastructure equipment and facilities, and um, the other half by uh, ANU themselves, and our partners have contributed the uh, remaining <coughs> funding. So um, there's a, a contract in place for RIT Associates to do a design and fabrication of a prototype system because this is, 
still the research and development, of course, you can't go for the full 10, 20 watt you'd like to get at the end of the day, but uh, you have to be a bit more reasonable with the requirements. So uh, contractual requirements is five watts because we are quite confident this is something that we can easily achieve. <coughs> Um, based on current results, the system is, the prototype is likely going to deliver on the order of 10 watts. Um, and uh, it's to be delivered um, during the first half of next year, around March 2019. The rest of the um, requirements are aligned with the optical laser. So this is a snapshot of the uh, program schedule. At SPIE in June, we were here, we're now there. Uh, things haven't uh, changed much. I mean, um, some, some um, activities are taking just a bit longer. We're spending, spending a bit more time on power scaling um, in order to increase the, the power level uh, in the lab before we assemble the laser cavity of the prototype itself. So there's two two parallel programs, one that's doing all the lab demonstrations and one that's actually building the prototype system. This is the team at RIT Associates. Uh, Greg Fetzer is a principal investigator on this project. He's also the director of the uh, laser department of RIT Associates uh, that has about 30 people working in Longmont. RIT Associates is a, is a larger company with several locations around the United States. There are a few hundred people strong. And this is his team here, um, standing by the side of the, the bench where we're doing all our um, demonstrations. So this is a closer view of the, <coughs> the lab table. Uh, of all this equipment, the only thing that, things that are relevant to the final system are in this box here, that's the laser cavity, and here that's the sodium cell. So it's a very small footprint system. And uh, a number of uh, experiments have been done in the lab uh, using uh, various stages of um, completion of the system in order to uh, study uh, uh, the behavior, for instance, in uh, single frequency operation or mode locking or uh, power scaling. Um, in two configurations, the linear cavity configuration, which um, works at 1178 nanometer. That's why you want to work on the output power because uh, when you um, slide in the nonlinear crystal to do doubling, you know, it's going to be proportional to what you get at 1178. And then, of course, uh, um, uh, studies in the L-shaped configuration, which is the final configuration. Uh, the 589 output will come uh, through this mirror here at 589, thanks to uh, the choice of coatings. So highly reflective here and here, and equal through 589, and all of them are highly reflective at 1178 to maximize the power inside the cavity. You said there's already a 532 nanometer? Yes, uh, co Coherent Incorporated has been commercializing the 532 version uh, for about 10 years, I think. Is that also frequency double? For the Verdi laser. Yes. Sorry? It's also frequency double. It's also frequency double. It's using a semiconductor chip. It's exactly the same thing. And they have, I can't remember, I haven't looked at recently, but they certainly have 10 watt versions and probably 15 and 20. Why 532? Uh, it's because um, it's easy to make lasers that laser at 11, I'm oh, sorry, 1064 well, we nanometer. Yeah. And yeah. when you double that, you get 532. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So um, this was the status um, as of SPIE when uh, single frequency operation has been demonstrated with the uh, small line which you want to get, uh, but at low power, just a few watts. The wavelength tuning um, over the D2 and D2B line had been done, but lo locking hadn't. So this has been demonstrated and, uh, and uh, programmed to work fine uh, since then. And in terms of power, uh, they're still working on, the, on bringing up the output power at this time. Uh, there's a number of um, uh, tricks we can play to increase the, the power in the laser cavity. OK. And I'll come back to that. But uh, just uh, to show you if I can flip through the laser going through the sodium cell and it's Fluorescing, not fluorescing, just to prove that we're on the sodium D2A line. 
And this is a, a, a diagram explaining how we do uh, wavelength clocking, which is you know, the standard technique I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point. Uh, there's a little delay when I press buttons, I'm sorry. Stick with me. Okay, so this is um, a model of what the prototype will look like. The laser head here will be, you know, not quite shoebox size, but you know, we're getting there. Uh, and the uh, uh, laser uh, cabinet uh, will look something like that. Um, the status um, as of today is that the laser cabinet is nearly uh, almost complete and uh, the um, laser head uh, final design hasn't been completed yet because we're still working on increasing the output power on the demonstrator on uh, the laser bench in the, in the lab. So um, mo most of the design is done, but not, not the final design. So this hasn't started yet. Okay, so the plan once the laser, the prototype is delivered is to install it on this uh, um, 1.8 meter telescope, which is conveniently located a few hundred meters from my office on Stromo Observatory. So, you know, don't have to go up the summit and uh, spend nights and stuff. We actually can do it all from there. Uh, this telescope belongs to EOS Space Systems, our industry partner, and they're using it to do um, um, tracking of uh, space objects. Most of the time, we're also using it for another um, activity uh, that we're part of a consortium working together on space debris. It's called the Space Environment Research Center, and I may have a slide about this. Yes. Um, so the Space Environment Research Center is a consortium funded by the Austrian government to establish uh, um, new techniques to deal with the problem, the threat of space debris. I'm sure you've all heard about this. There's a lot of junk orbiting Earth. Um, if we don't do anything about it, it's going to keep accumulating and uh, worse than that, it's going to start colliding. And after a number of collisions, there's a snowball effect that risks happening and then uh, renders some of the orbits that are the most populated unusable for future, um, future activities. So a lot of our way of life relies on, on space these days, anything from communications of the, you know, internet, telephone, uh, TV, but also um, geopositioning, satellite positioning, uh, banking, um, and then everything that has to do with Earth monitoring and observations, you know, to study the climate, study, um, I don't know, CO2 emissions and, and all that. So uh, that's, that's kind of a big issue. Climate change is definitely the <coughs> number one, but this will come close second uh, after it. So it's pollution not on Earth anymore, but in space as well. And what we're doing about it is uh, proposing a technique to use um, uh, lasers from the ground to mitigate the, the threat of uh, space debris collisions. We're not talking about removing debris from the ground. That's not really the most efficient way to do it. You have to go to space to do that. But at least we can prevent collisions. So we track debris. We predict where they're going to be orbiting. We predict if two debris are going to collide. And if two are colliding, then you can use a laser from the ground to um, to modify the trajectory of uh, one of the debris and avoid the collision. And then you delay the cascading effect, which is called the Kessler syndrome into the future. So we're building two adaptive optic systems for CERC, um, the adaptive optics imaging and the adaptive optics tracking and pushing. Well, as the name say, adaptive optics imaging will do mostly imaging of uh, uh, space objects and uh, adaptive optic tracking and pushing is, is solely for space debris and our demonstrations sometime next year. Um, the laser, so back to it, the semiconductor gas star laser will be installed here. This big box here is another laser that's being built by US Space System. It's a sodium gas star laser as well. It's based on fibers and it's based on some frequency. It's yet another kind of technology which is fairly large and bulky and complicated and I don't think has much uh, commercial potential in the future. So what we're gonna do is install the tiny laser head for the semiconductor laser here on their bench and um, either propagate uh, the semiconductor laser or the US laser or both lasers combined together to the sky to create a um, uh, laser guest house for an adaptive optic system. 
Uh, this is just a, a schematic of the rest of the laser gas alpha CET. Here you're on the laser bench, a um, few systems to relay the, the beam to the laser launch telescope, which is mounted on the side of the US 1.8 meter telescope. And that's a, a view of the actual model. Um, and we're, we're currently finishing a integration of all the components here to mount on the telescope uh, this month and next month. So uh, look at um, where we were back in June and how we're doing now. Single frequency had already been achieved. Reaching desired power levels, um, more exhaustive modeling and experimentation were going through this. So it's a lighter shade of yellow now. And consider power scaling approaches. I don't think it's red anymore. We have a number of uh, things we want to try. And there's additional funding that's been uh, identified in order to do that. Um, and I'll come back to that. Uh, in terms of um, um, performance demonstration, this is green. Most of it has been completed except for the ultimate power uh, demonstration. And as I said, we've, had, uh, we've identified some additional funding sources. So I applied for a new translational uh, fellowship at uh, the Australian National University, which I was successful uh, to, to get. And uh, this will support work on this uh, program for the next three years. Uh, I will pay for a postdoc and uh, um, a PhD student, as well as some equipment to keep working on that uh, technology. And the reason we're here, uh, in Hawaii visiting you guys is actually because we're going to spend some time working at uh, uh, Subaru Observatory next door. Uh, we've worked on the ground layer adaptive optics conceptual uh, design uh, with the team at Subaru and we're going through the review next week. Part of that of course is to use uh, laser gas star facility to create four laser gas stars. Subaru has already uh, procured a Toptica laser. They're interested in uh, thinking of you know maybe going semiconductor into the future for the uh, additional lasers. So um, the, the idea is to test the semiconductor gas star laser on the Subaru telescope. Next year it will be at EOS in, in uh, Australia and the year after that we'll bring it to Monakia so you have a chance to see it up close. And that's uh, the concluding slide. So I think that's the interesting point here. Uh, there's not, never enough funding, you know, to do these things. So if uh, Gemini has any interest in looking into the next generation uh, technology for guide star lasers, especially knowing that, you know, you guys want to do more guide stars here in the future, um, maybe you can think about this. Especially considering that this money, you know, whatever external partner is contributing can be leveraged two or three times in Australian money. Yeah, the idea is that we, we use uh, funding from our partners to request additional funding uh, by factor of four uh, with the Australian Research Council. Right. How is it when you've got 50 watts for a multiple, you know, for an array of laser spots? I'm sorry? How many watts do we need for an array of laser spots? Like well, it's typically 10 to 20 watts per laser gas star. Yeah. Per star. Yes, if you want to be operating, you know, 24-7 all, all year round. So it, it depends after that if you want to do, you know, adaptive optics in the visible or in the infrared or uh, so. But for instance, uh, ISO at their uh, adaptive optics facility, they have four lasers, uh, each 20 watt, and they get, you know, plenty of flux. They get, uh, like, what is it? They have small sub aperture. They are check out mine with 40 by 40 uh, sub aperture, so really small sub aperture. And even though they get more than 200 or 300 photons per, per millisecond and per sub aperture. So 20 watts is plenty if you want to do anything which is uh, non too much exotic. So for instance, for the ground layer adaptive optics system for Subaru, the plan is to use 10 watts per laser gas. Here on Monaco. But you said maybe you would add this one to the current optica? Well, no, Subaru wants to use four laser gas. They, they want okay. four laser gas stars, so it would be two 20 watt lasers okay. divided okay. by two exactly. to create four stars. Okay. But that's GLAO. So, so it's it, easy. It, it, it's kind of easy. <laughs> you have bigger sub aperture, you are going yeah. slower. Yeah. No, because I was wondering if you would install one of yours that is currently 10 and they're currently 20 optical. Uh, what would happen because two lasers would be much brighter than 
yeah, yeah. So it's just it's just a demonstration yeah. we're going to do on Subaru. We'll be able to show performance on the telescope, and meanwhile, we keep working on increasing the power. Yeah. There's additional funding I didn't mention, which is coming our way uh, through the Air Force Research Lab as well. They're also pursuing the same technology. And we're in discussion about how to make it an official collaboration. So they're interested in much higher power than astronomy is. So that should you have, help. Do you have any competition elsewhere in the world? Mm -hmm. uh, there's other programs looking at the same technology in the US, yes, that are funded by the Air Force. But uh, RIT is one of the competitors. There's three places doing this. Can I have the oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Oops. My watch is not working, but what is it, 325, something like this? Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. Yes. Oops, I'm starting to break things. Okay. So I'm going to take the, the second uh, half of, uh, of this hour presentation to talk about uh, a different subject, which is something that. Uh, emerged uh, a year ago about, uh, which is uh, a new program by ESO to build um, an MCO system for uh, correction in the visible on uh, the adaptive optics facility at uh, UT4. So uh, this is something that's uh, quite big actually for us and for a number of other institutes. Uh, institution. uh, it's a very uh, ambitious instrument. So, and, uh, so I'm going to go through that. Uh, so yes. An MCO assistant visible image on spectrograph, it's called Mavis. Uh, ISO wanted to call it BioOI, and we decided it was not a very nice name, so we came up with Mavis. And the uh, motto is sharper than GWST and deeper than HST, which is actually true. Okay, so it's, a, it's an effort, you know, I'm presenting that, but it's an effort. Uh, I'm using materials from a number of people, uh, and you will recognize, you know, also ex Gemini people in there, uh, Richard McDermott is uh, actually the project scientist for, uh, for Mavis and the PI. And there are other people uh, and there are the, in Australia and, and in Europe. And Benoit Echel is also part of the And Benoit Echel is also part of the consortium. That's right. Yeah, we will see that later. So uh, <laughs> during the next 35 minutes, I'm going to present maybe this, uh, I present also the ISO context, um, uh, the general motivation for doing maybe this, uh, the consortium, science motivation. We have uh, already a quite a BP science case. Uh, um, uh, Richard actually made a call for white paper in June or, or March, which was uh, fairly successful. We had a, a very enthusiastic and complete response <coughs> from the community, and we already have, well, we have, we have not even started phase A, which is this conceptual design, and we already have 270 pages of uh, science kits, so that's actually <laughs> quite impressive. Uh, I'll describe shortly also the, the project and the instrument, and then uh, the expected performance. All right, so uh, in a nutshell, so this is the executive summary. If you have to, to remember uh, anything, that would be this slide. So maybe, it's, as I say, it's a visible uh, MCO system. It serves uh, uh, corrected images over a field of 30 arc seconds by 30 arc seconds to an imager and a spectrograph. We expect trail, uh, when, when we say we expect, you know, these, these are the ISO, what they call the TLR, the top level requirements. So they are asking for Strain ratio uh, at B-band of the order of 10 to 15 percent, which is not much, but it's already very, very difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this is using four plus LGS. Uh, the ISO is not really open to grading the AOF. They have suffered through the commissioning of this four laser gas star facility. However, we believe that four might be actually a little bit uh, too just, uh, too, but might be too constrained. Uh, oh, sorry might be uh, limiting uh, the performance too much by the uh, tomographic uh, error in, in an optics system. Anyway, so uh, maybe five, maybe six. Uh, there is a very strong uh, emphasis uh, by ISO and by ourselves, the consortium, to, have, you know, to boost the sky coverage to the ultimate value possible. Because we know from experience also with uh, MCAO at Gemini that sky coverage is actually a key, uh, a key uh, characteristic or uh, of the system for, for its use and its adoption by the, uh, the, the wide you know, science community. So sky coverage, is always calling for 50% uh, at the galactic pole, which I believe is actually not physically doable, even if you push everything to 100%, but uh, this will be subject of uh, further investigation during the phase A. Uh, yeah, we're not yet clear about the spectrograph, so what do we want to do, an IFU, do we want to do a MOS, uh, it's not, uh, not yet clear. I remember this is in the visible, everything is visible. ISO UT4, um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. The consortium includes four 
uh, Institute uh, in Earth in Italy, uh, AO Stromo, which is AU, I'll, I'll come back to that later also, AO NQ, which is the AO that you know, that's, uh, I'll come back to that later also, and LAM, the Laboratoire of Physique de Marseille. Uh, so, okay, so that's it. Now, uh, numbers, you know, uh, as far as uh, how much it's going to cost, you know, uh, well, the manpower in, uh, you probably know that, and Scott knows, knows that better than anyone, is though when they build instruments, they don't pay for the manpower. They are, they are requesting uh, the community to actually come up with the money to pay their, their FTEs to build the instrument. ISO pays for the hardware, so uh, ISO has a hardware budget of 8 million euros, which is about yeah, 9.5 million dollars to, to buy the hardware for this instrument, but all the manpower is contributed by the institutes. And in exchange uh, of uh, paying for this manpower, uh, the, uh, the community gets uh, a number of uh, guaranteed uh, GTO nights, sorry, and in that case, uh, it's 150 GTO nights. So ISO has changed their uh, their scheme for that. Uh, prior to this instrument, the, G, the number of GTO night was based on the, uh, the, the manpower actually, you know, spent to build the, inst the instrument. So the consortium was, going, was, was saying, you know, okay, for this instrument, we need 250 FTEs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and ISO, there was a, a rate, you know, I don't remember, like 0.7 GTO nights per FTE or something like this. And, uh, and ISO was saying, okay, you get, you know, uh, 150 or 200 or 100 GTO nights. So, however, uh, there was a, uh, 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 ah, sorry, uh, news. Uh, which is this gigantic, uh, humongous instrument, uh, very, very successful, very, very powerful, but it's also a huge instrument. It, uh, and uh, uh, Roland Bacon, who was the PI, you know, came to ISO and said, well, okay, we need 300 FTEs. And, uh, and we need 300, yeah, 300 FTEs, and we, we are requesting 250 GTO nights. ISO had to say yes, but after that, they say, we changed, you know, the, we changed the scheme. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, now it's going to be flat. If it's a passive instrument, it's 150 nights flat. So for us, you know, it's not really uh, advantageous in the sense that maybe it's because it includes, you know, already this very, very ambitious uh, AO system, plus it includes an image and the spectral lab. It's going to be a fairly uh, expensive instrument to build. So we're still, you know, thinking about maybe renegotiating with ISO for that, but okay, we're not there yet. So where we are at is that there was a proposal for phase A that came out in uh, May. So ISO released the proposal. Uh, and, uh, we have been working um, around the clock since then to submit a proposal that was submitted uh, on the 14th of, December of uh, September, so a month ago, three weeks ago, to ISO. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, right now. So uh, in a nutshell also, uh, ISO is counting on about seven to eight year development overall and uh, to have uh, a first light of maybe which is in sync with the first light of uh, the ELT as envisaged currently, because uh, there is a very good uh, complementarity between, uh, for instance, Mikado uh, in the infrared, MCO system on the ELT in the infrared, and maybe uh, MCO system in the visible and the VLT. Because the ELT is larger, but the wavelength is larger also, so the resolution is about the same. Okay, so that's really, you know, maybe in a nutshell. And so, then so what, what is the FTE estimate for? So FTE estimate, uh, we haven't done it yet. What we have is the FTE estimate for the phase A, sure. uh, which is 16 FTEs. Yeah. And then after that, uh, well, we develop, you know, all these during the phase A. So phase A in uh, ISO lingo is, uh, is more or less the equivalent of a concept. <coughs> And I expect, you know, based on the uh, history of ISO instrument, that is going to be uh, between 150 and 200 uh, FTEs for uh, to build in the whole instrument. So maybe uh, we've done uh, uh, like other, you know, people building instrument. We have this fact sheet, and uh, so what is maybe? So I've already explained that. So this is uh, okay. Uh, the science, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back also to that later, but it's really a facility instrument. So we do have uh, two, three, four um, uh, uh, lighthouse science case, I would, so I would say, you know, uh, really stuff that are, are very, very well suited and uh, will be served uh, extremely well by Mavis, but it's also a facility instrument. So in fact, there is a really a very, very wide range of science that can be addressed with Mavis, and I'll come back to that later. And those are really the Stroman-Mavis requirements. So 
uh, as I said, you know, 30 by 30 axon angular resolution, anywhere between 15 and 20 milli axon as D band. Uh, web band coverage, uh, it's really focused on VRI, but uh, uh, ISO is asking, you know, to uh, investigate whether it is uh, doable and interesting to push uh, toward the blue. So there is a number of science cases, yes, toward the blue. Personally, I think it's going to be really challenging. And uh, I would like to avoid, you know, uh, compromising too much on other areas, for instance, the optical design or a, a blue application that might actually, you know, be useful only 1% of the time or something like that. Um, yes, sky ratio, sky coverage, so they're, they are calling for 50% of galactic pole. As I said, you know, I think it's going to be challenging, but maybe 20% is doable. And this is galactic pole. So as you go away from galactic pole, of course, it, it goes up you know, relatively fast. Uh, 7 milli axon pixel size imager, so this is well tuned to a 4K by 4K visible detector. And the spectrograph, we are kind of hesitating between different concepts. He's always calling for an, an IFU, what they call a quarter of news. But so that would be if we are sampling like uh, the, the news narrow field uh, mode is sampling, so that would be only 3.5 by 3.5 axon. I think something is 25 milli at this level, yes. But we, uh, if we go for an IFU, we are kind of leaning to our larger spaxels, uh, kind of 50 milli at maybe, and have, you know, almost 10 at of field, therefore. Or it could be a MOS, uh, because the, the, the problem with the IFU, it's not the problem. If the science calls for an IFU, we go for an IFU. But the thing is that the IFU is not really using this wide corrected field that the uh, MCU is, is, is providing. So whereas a, a MOS would definitely, you know, do better. Um, however, MOS have, you know, limitation, uh, especially if we are, you know, considering, you know, a crowded field of, you know, things like this. Uh, uh, just the slip, you know, might be uh, subject to crowding and uh, difficulty in extracting, you know, different contribution from them. Okay. That's one. Yes. Um, sky coverage that's related to the brightness of the tilt. Star. Yes, exactly. What is that limit? What is that brightness? Uh, so, okay, so, Visual uh, okay, so we, we, we are, uh, so that, that's a question of design. So what we are thinking is, is now we are uh, thinking of doing the same way as TNT is, is going for their MCO system, meaning using infrared optic testers, or optic testers in the infrared, and correcting them also with uh, some kind of deformable mirror, so that we have really uh, diffraction limited uh, infrared testers. And that's the, the ultimate, you know, you can do. You have to pack all this light, and then uh, yes. So to answer uh, your question, uh, so for the about eighteen or something like this. But you usually think about number of photons and not really. Uh, okay. <coughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay. So just also to give you a little bit of context. So a little bit more than a year ago, in July two thousand and seventeen. ISO, or the government of Australia, uh, sorry, yes, came up with a totally unexpected announcement. We are joining ISO. So somehow, you know, they found uh, a, a few million dollars or a few tens of million dollars in their, uh, in their, uh, in their uh, cask and, uh, and, and decided, okay, let's join ISO. So this <laughs> has been pushed, you know, for many, many, many years. And it was actually the top priority of the Australian, uh, uh, the Australian astronomical community. And uh, it, it actually, you know, turned out uh, as, as a big, uh, big surprise. <coughs> but everybody was, uh, was, was happy about that. ISO also. ISO, you know, is uh, very much in demand for cash because of uh, the ERT. And therefore, we had a special deal in which, you know, we were allowed to be a strategic partner. So we are not a full member of ISO. We are just what they call a strategic partner. So we have not paid the, the capital cost to enter ISO, we are just paying an annual contribution of uh, I believe $5 million per year, which allow us to access all of the facility in Paranal and La Silla. We don't have access to ALMA, we don't have access to BALT. So 10 years, $12 million per year, uh, strategic partner, but we do have access to the instrumentation of uh, La Silla and Paranal. So we can be an instrument for them. Uh, the goal, in uh, Australia is for us, you know, to ramp up and in 10 years, actually become full member of ISO. So that's the goal. And to reach this goal, not only we have to prove that uh, we can uh, effectively use the ISO facility, and this has been actually quite nice, uh, quite good. There's been a, a lot of uh, uh, proposals uh, by the Australian community. And uh, I think we are 
the second run into, uh, yeah, we, we, are, we, are, we just finished the second uh, round of proposal. The first one, we were right at the level where we should have been. Uh, so it's pretty good. So as far as you know, uh, how we are using ESO, uh, we ramped up, I think, uh, relatively fast. Uh, the, there's another component is that uh, for the Australian government, you know, to provide the capital money, because at the end of the tenure, <coughs> if we want to become full member, we need the capital money. So uh, for the Australian government to, uh, to, to give that, we have to convince them that we can not only, you know, do good science with it, but also build good instrument for it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where Mavis comes in. Mavis was like a miracle for us because we have in Australia now uh, the uh, competence to build, you know, such an instrument with uh, AMU and our group and with uh, the AO uh, uh, in Sydney that is doing, you know, been doing post-focal uh, instrumentation for many, many years. Uh, so we have the, uh, the competence and, uh, and it's really well timed because if maybe, you know, uh, sees the light in eight years from now, it's going to be almost at the end of our strategic partnership. So, and for Australia to be uh, building such an instrument is for us very, very important. So, okay. Um, so that's the process, you know, ESO is following a process. Every time ESO builds a new instrument, it's following a process uh, to uh, uh, probe the community for uh, new science, you know, what is interesting. They, they did that and they, uh, they ended up with this uh, visible MCO uh, as a uh, next priority instrument. And this is quite important, in fact, uh, because this is likely the last DLT instrument for a number of years, because, you know, now all the ESO money is going toward the ERT. If you talk to Luca Pasquini, and I'm sure that you talk to, talk to him, Scott, but it's, he's saying that at least, you know, for the four, for the next four or five years, you know, there, there won't be any, there won't be money for another instrument. So it's only going to be used. And yeah, okay. So I'm going too slow actually. So let's, let's uh, glide, you know, rather quickly through that. The AOF, the adaptive optics facility in Paraná is the UT4 that's been upgraded with a deformable secondary mirror and four laser jet star for adaptive optics operation. I've been uh, extremely successful, uh, a long time in commissioning, etc. but uh, a very, very successful and powerful uh, facility. Uh, that is, uh, in a way, a little bit underutilized now, because if you think about it, you know, the, the whole investment of uh, upgrading the UT4 to the AOF was, I mean, costed a lot of money. I, I, I don't have the numbers, but it's, uh, it's in the tens of millions of dollars. So uh, if you include the manpower, I mean. So, uh, and, and in a way it's a little bit underutilized right now because it's only, it, it only has a, a ground layer mode and now a laser tomography uh, mode with the new snow field mode. So, but it could be better used. And actually, I think that that was one of the motivation for ESO to actually decide, oh, okay, next step, you know, it's going to be this MC in the visible, because now MC in the visible can actually, you know, it is doable and, and it's also going to leverage, you know, all of this investment that has been done for, uh, for the AOF. Okay, lots of instrumentation behind uh, the AO system at this AOF facility. There is Okai, which is a, a, a wide uh, infrared imager using GLAO. Then there is news now, which is extremely successful uh, with its white field mode, one by one half minute and the now field mode that has been commissioned uh, recently and uh, proven to actually perform extremely well. They got you know, close to uh, diffraction limited images. Uh, and then you know, a number of, of uh, the symphony, which is going to be replaced in 2020 by ARIS. Some reason to unlock the visible with AO. Well, I mean, okay, most of you here you are know, good half, you know, astronomers, so you know that uh, in, in, in the visible, there is, you know, this richness of, uh, of information. All of the atomic lines are there. So uh, if you really have the choice, you know, uh, you want to go to the visible. The, the sky background is also much fainter, uh, which allows you to go deeper, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there is, of course, you know, this uh, huge, huge advantage is that now, uh, in the, the diffraction limit in the visible on, it, on an eight meter gives you comparable or equal uh, angular resolution as two micro on the near on, on the near field. This was true already, for instance, for uh, gems. Gems on an eight meter in beam height had the same angular resolution as the HST in the visible. And most of the paper that have actually marked, you know, the science, uh, most most of the paper that are using uh, gems data are also using HST visible data. So this complementarity is extremely important and we'll go, we're going to replicate the same thing with Mavis, except now the diameter are like three times larger. 
Okay, so is 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 it doable? What time is it on? What time is this? Oh yeah, there. Okay, yes. Oh, it's good. So uh, because it's challenging if you are already uh, how we suffer it, you know, to uh, to commission uh, MCO in the infrared. So if you are going to multiply this suffering by four by by something <laughs> with a factor of four, four it is is very really challenging. So is it doable? Well, uh, we believe it is for uh, for two reasons. First. Visible adaptive optics has been demonstrated and is doable, uh, as proven by, for instance, a forerunner at the large binocular telescope, 650 nanometer. This is an image obtained by their uh, system using a deformable secondary mirror. And uh, typically, see, well, this one is 50% stress ratio, but uh, they can obtain easily 20 30% stress ratio. Uh, there are several so, so other systems, you know, for instance, uh, Magao and Magellan that has also, you know, been providing stuff uh, which is diffraction limited in the visible on the right. And Sphere, uh, Sphere works in infrared, but if you scale this uh, extremely high trail, you know, <coughs> to D band, it gives you uh, also 37% uh, of D band. And GPI is kind of similar, even though GPI doesn't, you know, reach uh, this, uh, this kind of trail. But uh, certainly, you know, it proves that you can um, control your budget. Uh, all right, so visible AO is doable on axis using natural gas star. And then the other component is that we've demonstrated with the uh, gems, uh, Gemini has out that multi conjugate AO is doable with laser gas star. But if you put these two together, I'm not going to expand on that because you know. So if you put these two together, visible AO is doable and multi conjugate AO is together. That's what we want to do with Mavis. We want to do uh, multi conjugate AO uh, in the visible. Okay. Uh, some words in the consortium that was, uh, as a PI, it was very uh, fun to actually set up this consortium. And I say that, you know, not being sarcastic, it was actually uh, quite nice. Uh, so we have very good relationship with INAF. Uh, INAF is the uh, Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica. I'm starting to be Italian because I'm going there, you know, I'm going to go there for the next 10 years. So, uh, so anyway, so INAF uh, is INAF, uh, but uh, we are actually dealing with uh, three institutes at INAF. Uh, uh, Padova, where uh, uh, the group directed by Roberto Ragazzoni, uh, Architri, the group directed by Simone Esposito, and uh, Roma um, uh, with uh, Fernando Canicini. So they are really, you know, we, we want to leverage their huge experience in uh, designing uh, AO system, uh, the optomechanics, uh, uh, the instrument software, etc., etc., etc. Um, we have also a consortium node, I would say, in, uh, in Australia, which is made by, uh, whoops, whoops. Uh, it says connecting. Uh, you dropped out, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm not sure. It might be the Wi Fi. Yes, maybe. <coughs> Should I connected to the Wi Fi now? Should I restart Zoom? Hmm. Zoom says it's connecting. Okay. Well, I'm yeah, just looking at connecting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so let's make me continue. If you want to. So yes, uh, at the uh, in Australia, so we have these two nodes, which is uh, ANU and then AO. And uh, I, I want to say a few words about this later because it can be a little bit confusing. And then in France, there is the LAM. Uh, the Laboratoire for Astrophysique de Marseille with uh, Thierry Fusco and Benoit Necher, that you know. And, um, they are mostly uh, going to contribute for the, uh, for the, the, the simulation, uh, system modeling, post-processing, uh, PSF estimation, and uh, all of the uh, adaptive optics control. Yeah, yeah, you can go and uh, have to join me there. Maybe turn my file off and on, I don't know. Yeah, you can, you know, let's uh, just uh, see if it's still connected. No, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to turn the Wi Fi off. I don't know. It's too many times. It's just too easy. Yeah, but then you have to spend 10 minutes Eight hundred. Connecting. And yes, very good. Okay, share. Yep. Yes. 
So, oops, yes. Oh, there's stuff. In, oops. It says what? Uh, it has been. Um, you know when it's on. So Started screen sharing. Mm, okay. So maybe uh, press the buttons too fast. Not Keep sure. doing that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let me see if we can stop share and then start share again. Yes. Okay. Not following what I'm doing here. Uh, yeah, so it's you are sharing, but then yeah. Yeah, sharing, sharing the screen instead of the application. So you can either stop and reshare the application or it's not the both of them. It's not the both. That's not this one. Yeah. yeah. Let's just try to share that. Yeah, okay. Nope. The Wi Fi, I guess. Um, I can't. Uh, is it? Is that it? Is it going to be play it? Yeah, sure. Is it going to No, it's Oh, magic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't touch it. Yes. Let's see. Yeah, it does work. Okay. So, uh, some word. So sorry, but that. Okay. So, some word about the AAO. So, uh, because there's been some more saturation lately uh, in Australia. So, uh, we used to have AAO, which was the uh, Anglo Australian uh, Anglo Australian Observatory, and then it was changed into uh, uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory when the English left. And then recently, as a result, actually, as a, as a result of uh, uh, Australia joining ESO, AO, which was under the Department of Science and Industry, had to actually leave because the, the government said, okay, we can come up with $12 million per year to pay the ESO membership or the, the, the partnership, uh, but we cannot you know, sustain this $5 million that we were giving to the AU. So this will be used to pay for part of the uh, ISO membership. So uh, as a result, uh, everything has been restructured in Australia. So AO is not anymore under the Department of Science. Now AAO is now called AOMQ. It is uh, now, uh, well, AO, it is this, the AO is now you know, the, the whole thing here. So we have also, uh, sorry, even me, I'm getting confused. I'm getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> There's been so much change recently. But it, 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 anyway, so this AOMQ is what used to be AO okay. in Sydney. It's now under Macquarie, which is managing the, uh, the XAO. But AO is now uh, a larger, if you want, uh, uh, it's a national instrumentation capability. It's, yes, it's a national uh, <laughs> instrumentation capability that is now made of three nodes, so AOMQ. AO Stromlo, which is uh, uh, at, at the AU, that's where uh, Celine Max left work, and AO Sydney, which is uh, at the Observatory of Sydney. So when now we, we refer to AO in Australia, it is the whole thing here. Yeah. And if you want to talk about this one, it's AO and Q. If you want to talk about this one, it's AO Stromlo. And AO now stands for Australian Astronomical Optics. Optics. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this yeah, AO here is uh, AO. Like too, this, this institute or this capability is uh, is uh, overseen by the AAL, which is the Astronomy Australia Limited, which manages uh, essentially uh, the money for astronomy uh, at the level of Australia, and also uh, uh, overseen by a, a group, if you want, of uh, of the the managers of these three institutes. So, for instance, Matthew Collets and... Uh, so is AAL kind of analogous to Gemini's Aura? Yes. 
Yes, it was very similar. Very similar. I found another. Uh, <coughs> what is an S? So they also made uh, uh, okay. uh, okay. the. Yeah, yes. Okay. It's complicated because half of the yes. GMC partnership from Australia is for real, and the other half is for ANU. ANU is a direct member. Right? Yeah, direct member. So we have 5% through ANU and 5% federally, which is uh, managed by the AL. Yes. Okay, this I already talked about. Mm. So uh, science, so there was a huge uh, amount of work done by, by Richard. He's been you know, extremely useful, very, very active, contacting and coordinating with the community. Uh, so what I'm presenting here are graphs that uh, he came up with uh, and that are in the uh, phase proposal, the science and technical proposal. So OK, there's all this you know, work, uh, maybe in context or in context with uh, other facilities. So you see that it's kind of a, a more or less a, a, Sync would be uh, with the first cycle of, of the ELTs. Uh, it is also, you know, very much parallel with G the GWLT. So it is going to provide this. Uh, well, hopefully, you know, that's the goal. Uh, this, this capability that uh, that HST uh, <coughs> Planet and Camera is, is providing right now, but in the future with a slightly larger, uh, higher uh, resolution. And uh, um, so that's another one, you know, it, it fills up, you know, domain of the uh, sensitivity wavelength or angular resolution wavelength uh, that is uh, not really filled right now. So it's uh, also interesting in that context. Uh, very quickly also, uh, white paper. So as I was saying, you know, in, uh, in March, uh, we had actually a science workshop or a Mavis workshop in Sydney, attend well attended by uh, over 50 participants, uh, out of which uh, but 15 were from Europe, so we attracted, you know, a number of people. But no, it's, it's, that's one of the, the challenge in Mavis is this geographical, you know, configuration of the consortium where people in Australia, people in Europe, is eight to 10 hours difference. It's gonna be challenging for a foreign in meeting. And uh, it's also challenging ju just for travel, you know. The Australian are actually uh, very much used to travel to Europe, much more so than European to travel to Australia. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, the, there was this call for a white paper and uh, we ended up uh, with 57 white papers um, from four to six pages, you know, describing uh, one particular science format. And uh, uh, with 150 uh, co-authors and 47 institute, institution involved. So we're actually very, very glad with that. Um, so Richard, you know, classified them and uh, so it really covers, you know, anything from Southern Planet to Iron Chief Universe uh, going through uh, all, all this, the distance there on here. And if you uh, classify that by OPC category, which is this ESO, uh, uh, what is it? Observ observ Observational Program Committee, something like this, Observing Program Committee. Uh, so uh, it, see, it's, it's also roughly, you know, uh, spread over all of the OPC categories. And that's quite interesting, actually, because uh, we want to demonstrate to ESO that this instrument is actually a facility. <coughs> because there was a, a, some dissension within ESO that this instrument actually was the, the next instrument uh, uh, for the VLT was the way to go. Because some people were saying, no, 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 we should build you know, another muse, for instance. There was, there was uh, this, uh, the, the whole movement that was saying, you know, oh, let's, let's build the blue muse, so a, blue, a muse, but uh, optimized for the blue with larger pixels. And, uh, and then people were saying, no, 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 MCO in the visible is too much of a niche instrument. So we actually want to come back to ISO and say, hey, that was a good idea. Look, this is really a facility instrument because if you actually classify maybe uh, capabilities or uh, not capabilities, sorry, but the, uh, the, all of the programs, so the, the colors here are the same as the color here, okay? <coughs> but you can classify, you know, an instrument from really wide uh, use, wide, wide range, you know, uh, over all of the science area here on the left, to very, very specialized instrument on the right where you are, you are only one addressing one type of science. Yeah. ESphere, you know, is exoplanet, yeah. and then extruder is, is the exact op opposite. Well, maybe if you classify them, you know, from the, 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 the more equal spread within all science category to the less, maybe this is actually well uh, into the the facility instrument category here. So that was quite interesting for us to see that. And because of the lack of time, I'm not going to go through the science cases, but uh, you know, there is a number of uh, quite interesting uh, science cases that are all related, you know, 
with this uh, capability of uh, uh, resolving stars and, uh, for instance, you know, uh, a stellar population in uh, in, uh, in uh, neighbor galaxies. So uh, where you are uh, actually now uh, doing a much much better job, you know, uh, resolving uh, stars and being able to actually construct. Uh, uh, construct you know main sequence diagram like this and being be, be, uh, doing a much better job of identifying you know uh, the uh, the history of their uh, their formation. So again, you know, I've, I've, I guess I've spent uh, too much time doing other things. Through uh, through yes, this uh, you know early early galaxies and how they assemble and the structure of all the clumps that we see in early galaxies like that, which right now is right at the limit of what we can resolve with HST. And we've made this, you know, with this factor of three better resolution, we'll be able to see, you know, if these clumps actually are smaller or if they are actually um, as as they uh, as they uh, they seem to be right now. So, okay, simple example, you know, uh, this uh, here. If you talk, you know, 120 million absolute resolution, you see big clump, big big clumps like that, and if you take it at face value, you know, you'll have a distribution of the the, the, the the clump radius, which is like that, whereas, you know, with maybe you can do a 10 times better, and therefore uh, that will that, that would lead to totally different results. And, uh, oops, it's, what is it doing here? Yeah, there's a delay. Uh, I'm almost at the end, so Probably if it crashes now, it's right. probably okay. So that's a science case that's been um, uh, contributed by uh, Michele Trenti, uh, University of Melbourne. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, yes, looks I'd like to go fast through them, but plus many others. So uh, this many others is, is uh, yeah maybe it will be like HST from the ground, but better. So that that's something which is actually you know interesting is that uh, one of the, uh, the the it's not the science case, but one of the side effect of maybe is that now we will have uh, an AO system that provides a wide field, wide field, semi-wide field images in the visible. And we'll be able to actually produce images like that. Uh, we cannot in the infrared just because there is no, you know, nebulosity associated with infrared emission, but we'll be able to do that. So there is uh, a PR aspect, which is not negligible. And I see uh, Peter all of a sudden, what mm -hmm. PR? <laughs> <laughs> He's waking up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's uh, okay. Uh, a snapshot of uh, all of the science cases. This white paper that we had uh, actually before the end of uh, before submitting the proposal. So there's now there's there's more. And uh, I think I'm almost at the end. So we had a workshop, as I said, you know, in May, uh, 52 participants uh, over three days. So uh, half of the talk were science uh, science talk and half of the talk were technical talk. So we had technical people and the science, you know, mingle for for three days, and that was uh, very useful. Gaetano wanted to come. He was not able to make it in person, but you were connected remotely. And uh, and yes, yeah, so no, I'm not very finished. Maybe a couple of you more. So. Uh, the challenges, of course, you know, it doesn't come without, uh, without challenges, maybe. Uh, so the challenges, you know, are, are, you know, associated with the short wavelength. So how short do we want to go? Uh, there is a number of uh, error terms in the uh, adaptive error budget that are associated with this tomographic aspect of uh, MCO, which are essentially generalized fitting, which is the fact that we have only a limited number of deformable neurons. So uh, whatever is in between, you know, uh, deformable you know, is only partially corrected, and therefore there is a residual which uh, might kill the performance at 500 nanometer if this residual is too big. And then the sky coverage, of course, is uh, is also uh, a challenge. So uh, for that, uh, we have we are adopting a no compromise approach. So uh, we're not trying to save and to cut corners. So we are directly going to. Uh, Infrared, you know, tip tip gas star using a uh, Safira APD array, so zero noise essentially, and a compensation of the gas star using their own or its own uh, dedicated uh, deformable neural in front of the sensor. So, really, the, the maximum, if you want, uh, uh, we can we can do. And uh, so, if we cannot reach the fifty percent with this, uh, we'll uh, never be able to to, to reach it. So, astrometry. Astrometry is a very interesting point. So uh, yes. How many NGS? Uh, three NGS. Three NGS. Three NGS. 
So we have three Sapphire IRS and uh, three Deformed Bagnon. Right now we are considering, uh, um, actually we are looking at Alpao initially, but they have too large a pitch. So to, to make it, uh, to compact the whole optical design, we are now going for BMC's uh, Boston Micro Machine. Although this is, I mean, uh, uh, an example design or initial design, it can be, you know, refined or totally changed in the future in the phases. Uh, astrometry, yeah, astrometry, uh, uh, when we built GEMS for, for Gemini, uh, we had uh, lots of requests for astrometry, but at the time we were saying, yeah, it's, it's, it's too complicated. We will sign up only for one mini of uh, astrometry. It turns out that since then we are doing quite uh, significantly better, although there is still a, uh, long-term drift which is not totally controlled but astrometry the, the bottom line is that uh, uh, many mco uh, program actually are relying on you know i mean mco provides a good correction good correction over a finite field so necessarily there will be uh, there will be science cases that are looking at how the object you know where the objects are in this field and therefore astrometry Another reason is that uh, astrometry uh, makes a good third of the science cases for uh, Mikado, the MCU system in the infrared for the ELT. And therefore, necessarily, if we want to complement Mikado, we have to do as good a job, as good as good a job for with uh, with Mavis. So astrometry will be. Uh, will be very important and uh, it has a uh, huge implication on the optomechanical design. So we are folding that in from the beginning. And yes, so, well, okay, there, there are a number of simulations, you know, that has been um, carried uh, out already by uh, members of the consortium. The good thing is that in the consortium, we all more or less, you know, have a good adaptive optics uh, uh, competency and uh, expertise, sorry, expertise. And therefore, we uh, we all have developed, you know, some kind of capability for uh, adaptive simulation and system modeling. So we'll be cross-checking each other results, which is quite important. And just to give you the, uh, an idea of the other projects here, um, we want to. I mean, in in, in total, we'll 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 need to, to reach about 125 nanometers. So that's quite challenging. And uh, yes. And I'm not going to uh, detail the uh, optomechanical design, but it's a, a very original and innovative optical design with a, a mostly uh, transmissive optics. And that's allowed by the fact that now we have kind of inverted, you know, the, uh, now we are doing the science in the visible and the ticket sensing in the infrared. Whereas most of the EO system to date, we're doing, you know, science in the infrared and uh, and the, uh, the sensing in the visible. So this allows us to change a little bit the paradigm of the optomechanical design. So transmissive um, uh, elements here, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Good optical design. So the whole thing here, uh, so that's the science path here, going to uh, this uh, area here, which will be the instrument cluster. And uh, by using this mirror, you know, by rotating this mirror, we can uh, actually uh, serve uh, up to four focal station, so that's quite good. And then we have all the uh, infrared uh, tip tilt waveform sensor assembly here with these uh, infrared APDs, the Sapphira, uh, uh, Boston Micro Machine uh, Mirror, etc. Et and that's uh, for the MGS, Francois, same strategy as the AOF, 40 by 40 shaka. Yes. Yeah, you don't change something that's just successful a, like that. So uh, their, uh, their waveform sensor is actually working quite well, so we we'll use exactly the same. Okay. 40 by 40. And uh, so we have four to six uh, waveform sensor uh, for the laser gas here. And uh, I'm not going to detail anymore, but uh, oops, okay. Yeah, we've, we are planning also to have a variable uh, asterism. So the default is to have this 30 by 30 arc second uh, field. However, uh, in some condition, it might be interesting to reduce uh, the field of view when turbulence conditions are really not adapted, or if uh, your science, you know, just requires, you know, 10 by 10 arc seconds, so you don't need to serve 30 by 30, and you improve the performance quite uh, dramatically by doing that. And uh, that's the last view So we've uh, we've done a lot of uh, touring uh, Europe to set up the consortium. Uh, we've prepared and uh, executed this Mavis, Mavis workshop 
And then uh, the COFA proposal from ISO came out uh, in May. Uh, since then, we've been working uh, around the clock to submit this proposal uh, mid-September, and we should have the answer um, before the end of the year, because uh, ISO was coding for uh, uh, validity of the proposal throughout the 31st of December. So necessarily, they are going to answer before that. Uh, we don't know how soon. Um, we don't know. We suspect we are the only consortium, but we are not sure. Because uh, it's right that as far as you know, electric optics expertise, uh, there are not many, many groups around the world. And, uh, and we have really, have, I've not heard about, about any, anyone else that uh, would have submitted. Maybe some people submit a proposal that are totally out of the scope of, uh, of this. Uh, I know Roland Bacon wanted to submit you know, a Blue Muse proposal, whatever happened. So uh, this is totally out of the scope of what ISO is, is, is requesting, but okay, who knows. And that's it. So we have a website with blogs, static pages, and uh, things like that. And that's it. Thank you. And we are really excited in Australia to do that. It's a unique opportunity for us. I know we're running pretty late, but um, yeah. if you need to go, but if you have any questions. So. The only thing is the, the other thing is that why, as far as consortium, you know, why uh, is Australia leading this instrument? Well, first because we are interested in leading this instrument, but also because the, the European, you know, have their hand full of the PLT instrumentation right now, so they uh, they don't have the resources to actually take over, take on, you know, the whole thing. I'm surprised there's so little German involved. Yes. Well, German, you know, they've, they've never been, you know, super involved in NFT optics per se. Heidelberg was, yes. And then uh, there is the group, of course, of... Uh, yes, Genzo, thank you. Uh, with, uh, with gravity, but there are more use, users. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, what they've done with gravity. Uh, yeah. Is Durham also, of course, in, uh, in the UK ATC, but mostly Durham, you know, that's been involved in AO for a long time, but uh, they seem to be you know, probably busy with other things. There's a German group doing adaptive optics, but for other applications for um, laser communications in particular. Mm -hmm. and the, uh, Impressive how many proposals came out of Australia, 32, 32 or something, or 30. Is the number of proposals that White papers that came out of Australia. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, 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 that's right. Yes. <laughs> no, we are quite happy with the uh, participation. Yeah. Anything else? So, <clears throat> are there any challenges, or what do you need to do differently to do the sensing in the infrared as opposed to in the optical? Oh, so it's tilted sensing, just uh, tilted sensing. So it's just you need this mirror and then you just need to image, you know, the, the star and it will be diffraction limited, hopefully. And you just, you know, compute the centroid. That's it. It's the detector, right? It's yeah. To do AO on the on the 18th magnitude star. No, 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 no. Ah, okay, okay. No, no, no. Yeah, because the deformable mirror is driven by the information, the tomographic information we have using the laser gas stars. So the laser gas star you know, gives gives you uh, Full, in, full information about how the turbulence is uh, spread mm -hmm. above the telescope. And once you have this tomographic information, you can project it in any, any arbitrary direction. So uh, what we do is that we take an average over the 30 by, central 30 by 30 epsilon, and that's what we use to drive the mirrors that are seen by the uh, science instrument, okay? And then for this, uh, for this tipped gas star that Which might be- somewhere outside that. Somewhere outside that, exactly, yeah. they might they, they can be up to 60 arcs more from the center in radius. Mm -hmm. So, because they, they will not be uh, corrected by the deformable mirror that corrects the science, mm -hmm. we need an additional deformable mirror to correct that. And uh, we are using uh, the, the information provided by the laser against our response to do that. And that's also that almost exactly, no, actually, no, the TMT. Uh, Nefarious is not doing that. Nefarious is yes, and, and, and they are compromising on the the science uh, trail to correct a little bit the uh, the, the TFT gas star that are outside. Yeah. This one is similar to the TFT star they use currently on on the AOF. 
They also have uh, an infrared. Uh, they do? I think they do. Okay. It's an infrared. Yes. Okay. So, so on, yeah, on gravity, they are using a Saphira, but uh, I didn't know that. Uh, so the, for instance, uh, Muse uh, is using also uh, a tip-tip GSR, but it, it has huge limitation on the tip -tip GSR because it has to be within the, the field of view of the science, the, the yeah. 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 So it gives you your sky coverage, which is absolutely uh, ridiculously, ridiculously small. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So what loop rate do you need to go out to make it work in the visible? About 1.5 QRs. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's not too bad. So that's that's uh, what I, I see it as the big challenge is maybe is that the, there is we have no extra room in the OR budget. Everything has to be tightly controlled. So you know uh, all of the EO systems that are running on the except for the extreme EO system like uh, GPI or Sphere, but uh, but most of the other EO system they have this OR budget and when when you when they do you know their telemetry and they try to compute all the terms. It's still an unknown term at the end, unknown, and it's typically 100 nanometer, unknown. <laughs> so, and we want the full budget for maybe to be 120 nanometer. So <laughs> we cannot tolerate any unknown term. So that's one of the new thing we have to come up with maybe is, is uh, some kind of intelligent way to uh, um, online, if you have an online estimation of each of the other term and see, you know, uh, if there is something drifting, we can see it immediately using the telemetry and say, oh, we, can, we have to recalibrate this or whatever, do something. And it has to be done also in a semi-automated uh, automated way because you know at the telescope, there won't be a, an AO PhD operating the stuff, so. Yes, thank you. All right, thanks yeah. again. Just a quick announcement, uh, Francois and I will be